Hi everybody and welcome to The Curious Geographer. Um, thanks, so we've just had uh, a testing just to see um, um, that everything was working because we've got some amazing guests um, who are joining us um, for the U from the UK School Sustainability Network. So thank you so much everybody for joining us. Um, the UK School um, Sustainability Network is a, uh, a group of regional networks of um, students who are doing amazing things and I can hear myself. Hold on. I'm just going to pause. Take two and welcome to the Curious Geographer YouTube Live. Um, I'm going to edit that bit out if you've just seen it. Um, so today we are very, very lucky and excited to be joined by the UK School Sustainability Network. Um, and we have um, four young, wonderful young people who are going to talk to us about the um, how they're involved with the UK School Sustainability Network, what the UK School Sustainability Network is, and how you can potentially get involved if you're interested in it. Um, so I had the privilege of joining their meeting earlier, and it was I was like writing down all these ideas of everything that was happening. I just think that. What the work they're doing is absolutely fantastic and I would just highly encourage if you can get involved and get your schools involved, please do. Um, if you are new to my channel, check out the QR code and also check out the live events that are going on as well. Um, we've got one more later in a couple of weeks on how we can decarbonize society. So that kind of ends up this um, spring live events kind of session, but definitely check that out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pass over to Noor and we'll introduce the young people as we um, go through the our kind of live interview tonight and kind of my first question is who are the UK SSN and what are your aims so I'm going to pass over to Noor. Um, hi I'm Noor from Oxford so who are the UK SSN? The UK SSN are a network of UK students and staff um, from schools and it's made up of smaller regional networks it started in 2019 with a partnership between two schools in East London, which then developed into the London Schools Eco Network. Since then, the network has expanded and there are now a dozen regional networks across the UK and Ireland, with a further eight in the process of being set up. UK SSN was formed in, in spring 2021 to bring students and staff reps from all across the regional networks together and the whole network is now hosted and supported by Global Action Plan. Brilliant, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that really good introduction, Noor. And if we go on to now to say, with the uh, young people have been up to COP26, which is amazing. So first of all, can we hear about what um, COP26 is? And Oren, you're gonna tell us a little bit about that. So I'm just gonna pass over to you um, now. Yes, so hello, um, I'm Oren and I'm from Northumberland. So what was COP26? 
Well, COP26 was the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference. Um, it was held in Glasgow and Scotland and, well, um, 197 different countries attended. And the hope was that they would agree on new targets that they would try and achieve. And um, the primary goal was being to achieve net zero in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, some of the pledges included that us as the UK, uh, we direct government support, um, no, we'd end direct government support uh, for fossil fuel energy sectors overseas. And we're also doubling our natural climate finance to help developing nations with 11.6 billion per year uh, by 2025. Um, India stated that they would significantly increase renewable energy source usage. However, um, they will continue to use coal as it provides most of India's electricity and it is also cost effective. Um, Brazil claimed that they would cut emissions by 50 percent by 2030. The president of Brazil, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, will actually follow through with his pledge um, considering that him nor any of his predecessors have actually stopped or have tried to change um, deforestation of the um, and obviously o over the past 50 years, 17% of that rainforest has been wiped away. So it shows how Herculean the task is going to be for him and his government. Thank you. And now if we pass over to um, Georgiana, who's going to tell us a little bit about the green zone. Wait one second, Georgiana. I'm just getting you up. Okay, and go, go for it. So um, uh, the green zone is basically an area in COP, which is a space for like civil society groups to run events. There are lots of stands you can meet with like the general public who are interested in the environment and so what I found there was the like, atmosphere was incredible because it's all these people from around the country and around the world who are all like fascinated in the environment and all the different projects they've been working on to try and help and so there were also lots of fringe events taking place there so there were um, discussions with, like intergenerational panels on climate change um, there was a talk about someone from Panama who'd been displaced by climate change and what he'd done um, as a result of that um, at all how going to space completely changes like perspective on the world and why we all should be acting and so then um, our role in the green zone was we were um, helping run a stall by, um, by pu um, people power um, and so basically we were using um, hydrogen power to create um, electricity because hydrogen's a like incredibly clean fuel um, and it's going to be like one of the really important fuels um, of the energy mix of the future as we move into like a more sustainable world. So yeah, the Green Zone was just like an incredible space to meet all these people and see all these different projects. And um, it, was it was just amazing. And so just to give everybody a bit of a concept, so were you up in Glasgow with, the COP, with COP26 and how long, how many days did you spend up there? Um, so we were there for, I think it was, three days and so yeah in Glasgow basically um, the meeting is split into the blue zone and the green zone and the green zone is just as I said like a space with lots of like stools and things to meet people whereas the blue zone is for the actual like agreements and like delegates where like thing that they make all the um, like policies um, and so yeah we spent about three days there just like meeting all these people attending all these events and trying to represent the youth and motivate politicians to, like continue to act. Brilliant, that sounds fantastic. And we're going to hear a bit um, from Sana now. So I'm just going to get you up, Sana, so you can um, speak. So over to you, Sana, if you could tell us a little bit about um, the Net Zero Classroom. Sana, do you check you're not on mute? Yeah. Um, yeah, so when I six, I went to the Green Zone with Georgiana and I met 
the Secretary of State for Education, Nadeem Zahawi, um, in a net zero classroom. So um, Nadeem Zahawi at the time appointed the um, Secretary of State for Education and the day prior to meeting him, he had met Noor in the Blue Zone where they had just launched, the Department of Education had just launched um, a sustainability in, in education package um, with lots of new proposals. Um, so the net zero classroom was brilliant and it was um, essentially the new way which they wanted to create all new school buildings. Um, it was modern and it was completely like sustainable. It had zero waste. And what was really important for me was not only how it had been created sustainable and completely through green measures and they'd outlined how they'd done it, but also the, the actual classroom itself looked very different from a normal classroom. And it was all about like incorporating nature from outside and bringing it inside and um, just to create a sustainable so that those students felt motivated to want to go into green skills and careers. Um, so that was just kind of like an example of like the innovation that I saw at COP26. So when we were at COP26 meeting Nadeem Zahawi, there was a panel which she was a part of, which was talking about green careers and green skills. And it was all about trying to encourage young people in schools to pursue green careers and skills and showing them what availability there is in the green sector and talking about the green industrial revolution. So after um, the panel, which we asked lots of questions to I actually got to meet the education secretary and I had a really really nice conversation with him um, and it was really interesting because he of course had just recently been appointed education secretary the challenges he, he was facing um, in terms of like trying to understand what young people want most from their politicians and stuff and us being able to give him a greater insight and then him also being able to help us so for example I had some very very like specific questions and it was amazing that I could ask someone who was like so directly involved and who was literally the top person in this country um, and I think that really reflected the whole spirit of COP26 it was like young people who previously might have felt that they didn't have a seat yet that they could speak to these politicians who had such a big direct impact and it felt very a, a much mutual relationship where we were both helping each other and I think that's really integral to solving the climate crisis. It needs to be lots of people all working together. So that was a really, really great experience. My mic. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was so interesting um, to hear. And as I said, I think they said that the politicians were more worried about the student young people's voice than potentially the media. But I think that just shows like how important young people's voice is. Um, and actually, hopefully that people are listening as well to um, the fantastic ideas in the future um, that you guys are kind of pushing forwards for. Um, I'm going to hand over to Noor, who also um, went to COP. Um, 26 as well um for your experiences on the blue zone um so yeah so out of all of us that went to cop um only three of us were um only three able to get into the blue zone which is the zone where that had we had to have un accredited so it was run by the un as opposed to the green zone which was run by the uk so it's where all the negotiations were happening we didn't actually see any of the negotiations but we did do some really cool stuff um once we'd got through security, which took us a, a slight while, um, we got to attend a talk by WWF about youth empowerment. And it was a really great start to the day because it also happened to be youth empowerment day. So it was like the perfect day to be in the blue zone. Um, then we wandered around the blue zone a bit and it was just this incredible atmosphere. It was loads of different countries and loads of different places. And there was just this atmosphere of even if the policies uh, that have come out of COP26 are are being called maybe not enough. The atmosphere certainly in the blue zone was amazing to be in and I was really grateful that I got to be there. Um, we then had lunch with, a, with an official from the Department of International Development um, and she told us all about how it was arranged and how things were going and how things were happening and that was really interesting to just learn about how they'd arranged it all and how they'd um, organised it and who was there and how it was all arranged. Um, then uh, someone who, one of the people who was with me um, got to be on this panel in the UK pavilion about um, the, the nature of our future and youth and nature based solutions. And it was a youth panel and there were some incredible speakers. They all did really well. You can find it on YouTube. It was an amazing panel to um, sit in the audience on. Um, 
And then after that, me and someone else, we were told we were going to be in the audience and then we were asked to sit on the panel with the Secretary of State Education. And it was really nerve wracking, but it was a really incredible experience because we got to listen in as the, as the Education Department introduced their new plan for green education and nature parks, which um, we're really hopeful will turn out to be really good. And certainly um, their draft strategy is a sign of hope. Um, then we were invited to go sit on, on this education summit and it was the first time that education ministers and environmental ministers had kind of, sort of sat in the same room and listened to people from all across the world um, talk about their plans. Um, it was a mix of environmental leaders and education ministers and they were all really great. They, it was just this sense that everyone wanted to introduce green education in different levels and on different platforms. Thank you. And you can hear that you guys just had such an amazing experience there and were open. I mean, these opportunities seem so fantastic. Um, I, as said earlier, had the privilege of joining you in your um, meeting earlier and I thought just the ideas or different concepts and you had speakers coming in, which was fantastic as well. And I wondered if we could talk about something which has been in the news recently. And I think, um, Georgiana, this is going to come towards you. And that is about um, climate anxiety and a lot of young people are talking about this um, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what is it um, have you done any work on it or why why is it important so if I start with Georgiana and then pass over to or um, after um, so basically climate anxiety is the idea that when we're constantly hearing about all these like detrimental effects of um, climate change and what the future could look like if we don't act enough um, then it's it can get very overwhelming and like sort of have detrimental effects on your mental health and so a lot of like people especially young people like our generation have been struggling with this burden like we're quite helpless and there's so much to do and um, our future isn't looking very bright. The main aims of the UKSSN is to actually empower young people and show that although um, this is like a terrifying crisis. We actually do have the power to all like act and come together and collaborate. And I think COP was a really good example of that. And so one of the things we did when we were there is we spoke to um, one of the heads of um, an education union and he, he was speaking to him about incorporating um, climate anxiety like more into the curriculum so people our age have the support they need to deal with this because the future generation really need to be the ones who are like feeling empowered and ready to tackle the issues. We don't want everyone um, feeling like too overburdened because then it can lead to people not acting like um, constructively. And so, yeah, we just um, had some like, uh, like we're trying to think of some ideas of how we could train teachers to um, be more supportive and like, un like be able to deal with that because obviously it is a difficult problem to solve because the future might um, is like jeopardised if we don't act enough. And so it's quite a hard um, problem to deal with and support like students with in particular. Um, and so, yeah, I just think it's really important that we're able to inspire the young generation. So, of course, everyone needs to be educated on the effects of climate change, but also we need to focus a lot more on solutions and look at um, climate change from lots of different subjects and in lots of different ways so different people can work out how their future is going to um, work so that they can like help the planet and live in harmony like with nature rather than going against it and not as well get overburdened by all the news we're seeing at the moment and so I thought that was really important and I'm glad like that was one of our focuses at COP. I think that was really interesting what you're saying about um, actually like giving like teachers also the um, skills to maybe deal with that um, as well in terms of like it's a really pressing thing for young for young people um, and the and Oren would you like to add anything onto that onto what Georgiana just said? Um, sorry. Um, yeah. So I definitely think that you talk about how kind of climate change can be a really overwhelming thing. And when governments talk about kind of global action and how we need to make a global effort, whilst it is actually true, I think it's the kind of small things that can help us combat climate change. And it's just the little things that people can introduce into their like regime. So maybe like buying more sustainable clothes, talking about it. So opening up more dialogue. And that is one of the big aims 
of the UK SSN to actually get more people talking about it. And even just respecting like green spaces such as parks or woodlands, I think that can really, really help with just battling against climate change. And I think um, what you were saying about the UKSN getting people to talk about it, that's what I found when I was uh, in like, in one of the, I mean, one of your many, many meetings. Um, and I just love being a guest in there, just hearing young people talk about how actually we can reach, I think the conversation is how you can reach um, more young people with social media as well to like create that support network. So I think, yeah, that communication, as you've said, is so, so important. Um, so I, I read a quote um, from Mitzi Janelle Tan, who is a climate activist, um, who said, none of us have a choice. Um, we all have to be activists because world leaders have left, left us with no choice. So she is a young activist um, and says that we have to have a choice because we have no other choice but to, to, um, to be activists. And so I wondered, what do you think, as all young people who are making a difference and who are in part of the UKSN, who have gone up to COP26, um, what do you think the role of young people is in kind of climate activism? Um, Sana, am I passing over to you for this one first? Yeah, so... ...to young or old. And I think it would be ignorant of us to act like, you know, these are simply vast sweeping tides of history, which we have absolutely no control or power over. I think we at least have to try. And what's important is that how much every person can try is individual and is inherently dependent on different factors, such as socioeconomic factors, levels of education, awareness, which is why I think it's so important that we do what UKSN is doing, which is trying to encourage people with different backgrounds, because they all have different perspectives and they're all, therefore they will have so much to offer. Now, in terms of our role, I think young people particularly, their role is to be both a symbol of hope and frustration and therefore to enact change in action. The new generation always has represented hope and change, two things which are integral to acting on the climate crisis. They bring new innovative ideas to the world. They see things with a new perspective. And I think that's you know their unique selling point. For example, this generation uses more technology than any prior generation. And with that, young people have an unprecedented potential global reach platform power, which they can utilize. And we have seen them utilize this for good. Young people are people who are constantly learning and constantly want to learn more and more. Um, and, and knowledge is absolutely power. So their thirst for learning paired with their often underestimated skills and understanding of the modern changing world gives them a very unique skill set, which is fundamental to climate action. And their other role, I said frustration. And by that, I mean young people aren't afraid to care, to care a lot. They're not afraid to be vocal if they don't like something that is happening. And they're not afraid to criticise authority. And I think that that bravery and courage that is so integral to teenagers, particularly or young people, has the power, especially when they come together in groups and organisations, to enact real change. And this idea that young people have a naive view of the which of the, the fact that they can change the world, and it's, this is a very naive way of thinking, I think that can actually be their superpower because it means that if they genuinely believe that they can have an impact on the world, that if they're frustrated with something, if they try hard enough, they can change it. It inspires and motivates and drives them to take real action despite any apparent barriers. And I think that determination, willpower and resilience is what makes young people so important in their role of enacting change in new and innovative ways. That was fantastic, Sana. Thank you. I feel like I should like you should wrap that up in an article and like put it on because what you've just said about the um, frustration of young people being the driving power and that is like your superpower almost. I thought that was just fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing your view on it. I actually have all of you five on screen at the moment and I just wanted um, we can either move on to the next question or I just wondered if anybody else wanted to say kind of personally what they think their role of young people is in climate change or maybe um, climate activism or maybe why you yourself is us as part of the UK SN are so kind of passionate about um, making a difference in terms of sustainability in our future so um, maybe just like raise your hand if you if you want to add on to that and I can like pass over to you anybody want to say their story great should we go for Noel first and then we'll pass over to Georgiana mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so um, I got yeah, so the I got the role of climate because a friend, because um, a friend, um, she sort of introduced me to the world, and I think that's, that's what, what I find, I find at school. Um, I talk to a lot, um, of, my to a lot of my friends about climate activism, activism, and they often say and things like, as an individual, they often I can't say do things anything. like, as an individual, I, I can't do anything. But I think sometimes it's not an individual. Miss sometimes it's not an. There's a there's a problem at the moment with climate anxiety because across like loads of different youth across the world. That's because we all care, and I think the youth as a particular group of people really care about the climate and I think that's why they have such an important role to play. Um, for some people it's their future, for some people it's their present right now where they're being impacted by the climate crisis and I think that gives people a real drive and I think particularly as youth um, we really care about the climate and I think that's why we have such an important role because we have so much passion and we are so worried. <laughs> And if you pass over to um, Georgiana. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that's been said. I just want to reiterate that, um, of course, like people sometimes feel like their individual impact, like changes or like a few like things, they fluctuate in their daily routines won't make a difference. But cumulatively, we like collaborate with collaboration. We can have such an impact. So I think it's really important that like every like young person is able to like feel um that they can how like with the uk ssn it's been like, like incredible to be able to um collaborate with different um people from different counties um so that we can actually um have a big impact with specific projects we work on and then um there are so many easy changes you can make to your daily life just to reduce your impact and no one should underestimate that fantastic um Oren, do you want to say what how you got involved with it um, yeah, so I I was in I was I've always had kind of an interest in the climate, but it, it kind of really I, I had a real drive for it when I did a crest award a few years ago, um, and I did it with some of my friends actually. And what we the great thing about doing an award like that is that you can choose the kind of topic that you cover. Um, the thing we looked at was biogas, so we looked at the effects. Of different liquids when you water plants just in your garden say and how much methane is actually produced when you um, water your plants with different um, liquids and I was kind of going into it thinking yeah well I think water is probably the best thing to water plants with it turns out it actually isn't um, I was very surprised to find out you can if you water your plants with a mixture of water and sodium hydroxide what happens is because it, uh, sodium hydroxide is an alkali, it actually is able to make the uh, soil and the plant more neutral over time. So it can also um, allow for better um, oxygen oxygenation um, in your garden. Um, so I've always, and thank you very much to Dr. Bachelder, um because she is the teacher who has got me into climate change. And obviously teachers, I, th I think one of the biggest things about climate change that I I don't see, I'd like to say, I don't see enough of is that kind of teachers, because we've obviously got the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the 17 goals the UN have set out. And I think the big thing about science is that you have to try and link different things in your life to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so that was one of the biggest things that got me into um, looking at climate change. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Sana, I, we didn't actually say, I know you, you did your good speech about the role of young people, but how did you particularly get involved with um, like climate activism or the UKSS, UKSSN? Yes, yeah, so um, I can remember the date. March 2019, um, I got involved. It was the first ever global youth strike, and I think I just liked the idea of it. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. <laughs> Um, and I didn't know much about it, but I had to research loads about climate change because I had to convince my parents and my school to let me go. And that was a task. Um, and it was actually through my research, I because I always knew climate change was a problem, but I didn't realise the extent of it. And it kind of draws back on that idea of hope and frustration. I felt very frustrated and it, you want to do something and you don't know what to do and you feel quite helpless. And so I went on this um, strike at the time and what was really crazy for me at the time was the next day like there were headlines everywhere because it was like i think millions of people like globally had done it and 
you know, all these politicians were like having these conversations and promising change. And I thought, wow, you know, just those few hours that each individual student went out on strike, they managed to inspire international global conversation. That's amazing. And I think ever since then, I just thought my motto has just been, well, as long as you work hard, you'll get somewhere. And so, you know, where I am today to where I was back in 2019, I never would have imagined I'd be, you know, with UKSSN and doing the things that I'm doing. But I think I've, so I got involved with lots of organisations. I run a host, chair, speak at lots of community engagement events. I'm part of the UK Youth Council, which the United Nations Environment Programme set up. I'm part of the UKSSN. And that's all just come through finding opportunities, finding contact and just constantly just being so frustrated that it just drives you to want to do something, anything. And sometimes you don't make your efforts don't come to fruition until much later, but it's always worth it. Brilliant. Thank you. It's been so great to hear how each of you kind of got um, to where you are now. And if we have kind of two kind of questions, well, one kind of for you, and then we've got um, Jess um, to go back to afterwards. But um, the UK SSN meets a few times um, per term on t- a Zoom to bring students and staff reps together from all regional networks, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and they also meet for specific projects and activities so I just wondered what kind of things are going on at the moment um and then is there anything that's coming up so Sano are you happy to say what, what's kind of happening happening at the moment it's the department of education the strategy that they published the sustainability strategy which we mentioned previously um they actually have um a youth advisory panel set up to like feed back to them and advise them on this climate strategy and myself along with Jack who is another member of UKSSN we were both selected to be part of this youth advisory panel um, and I think that was a really big moment in itself because speaking back to how like I just started off in my felt frustrated and I wanted to do something and I didn't know what to do I think the idea of just like working hard even if sometimes it's a while till you know your efforts are rewarded is really important because back in 2019 I, I wanted a seat at the table and now you know and that's not something I would have expected so that was something I think everyone should take away just keep on working because you never know what opportunities could come your way so yeah, I was selected and it involved me reading this strategy and analyzing it and covering it with annotations and a really big part of it for me was not just my own ideas but collating other people's ideas and it made me realize how important it is within the climate movement that we hear everyone's perspective because the things which I picked up on and I thought uh, when I was first reading the strategy when I spoke to other people within UKSSN and teachers um, students when I was speaking to teachers within my school and had meetings with them like discussing it like they all had very different perspectives and they all had different things which they thought would work or perhaps need improving And I think that's a really, really important part of the climate movement. It's just so collaborative and we need that in order to address the climate crisis. So um, for the Department of Education, we have a monthly meeting. So every month we go back and we focus on a different part of the Department of Education strategy. And it's a variety of young people from all across the UK, all with different backgrounds. And we feed them back to the Department of Education. We had Baroness Barron with us last time and we have civil servants there. And we essentially feed back our ideas and not only do we feed them back, but we also discuss constructive solutions to um, um, to act on the improvements we're suggesting. And I think it's been really, really, really important for me because I've understood com- the complexity surrounding writing government strategy and understanding how the climate crisis is clear cut. So, for example, some things like the nature park, which Noor mentioned, um, some schools will have space, green space to do that other schools will have no green space in their whole school. So it kind of brings up new issues we need to address. Um, so that was really interesting. And although it's complex, I think ultimately what I've learned is it's just about giving it your best shot and going in there and trying to make all the improvements you can and making the most of such a brilliant opportunity it's presented to you. And at the end of the day, whatever happens in the strategy, whether it's um, a success or not, only time will tell. But it's really important, I think, to be collaborative and just not only make your own voice heard, but make everybody else's voice heard when you're given a position like that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, And I've got to say that if there were any questions, um, just put them in the chat. However, um, 
these young, young people have been very very busy tonight so um we'll always we can always get back to you with questions as well but it's been great to have so many people joining live as well and um, so nor if you don't mind telling us what is potentially coming up and then um and then we'll go around to oran and um Orenso and georgiana Um, so really excitingly next, so in April, um, some UK students are going to get a chance to speak to Kate Rayworth, who's the um, professor behind Donut Economics, which is a model that balances essential human needs and planetary boundaries. And hopefully that's going to be a really interesting talk and we're going to get a lot out of that. That's really exciting. Have you guys watched the film 2040? Have you watched that? It's like not really available. It it came out a while ago for films, and they um they talk about Kate's um model of the donut economy. If you can get your hands on it, try and watch it twenty forty because she explains it. And it's yeah, I when I saw that on your schedule coming up, I was like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> um and um, Oren, anything else that's coming up in your network or anything else that um you're looking forward to with UK SSN? Um, so I've literally just joined the UK SSN. So I'm not really sure as to what is actually coming up, but some of the one of the things that I would like to kind of see is obviously throughout this conversation this evening, we've kind of talked about how technology has played a huge role in publicizing and talking to younger people. So the, the, one of the things that I'd like to try to see is some more publicity and um, more young people's views about social media for climate change. Brilliant. And um, let's just find where I am. And if I pass over to Georgiana, anything that's, that you're looking forward to that's coming up? Um, so I'm looking forward to like regrouping the Berkshire Eco Network because we have been inactive during COP, but we're trying to like restart and also maybe extend our reach more to like primary schools as well because um, we went into a primary school the other day and they were also interested in joining, which is like definitely um, something we'd be interested in because um, it's so important to extend like our reach. Um, and then also there's hopefully going to be a like summer trip to Oxford, which is like a chance for everyone who went to COP and like different members of the UK SSN to reconnect. So we'll be doing like lots of workshops together, like outdoors. And it's just a great time to like re-collaborate with the other regions so we can like work on more projects. Um, because when we were all together, it was like um much more like action took place and everyone um, like coming together just was so like good at COP. Thank you. And I'm now going to just pass over to Jess, but if you guys all just stay on just like the final couple of minutes and then we'll say goodbye to you all together. Um, so Jess, um, if you wouldn't mind telling us how students and schools can get involved. And I mean, you are the UK SSN, so you kind of started it. So um, it'd be fantastic if you could let us know what students who are inspired from watching this all teachers, uh, how they can get their students involved. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm Jess. Um, so I'm Jess Tipton, and so I originally started with setting up the London Schools Eco Network a few years ago, which started with just two two schools, um, like Nor said earlier. Um, so it's it started from very beginnings, which I hope sort of gives um, information and news. There's regular news stories posted on there about UKSSN. Um, and also about some of the regional networks. They're not all on there yet, but you can get a sort of feel. Uh, for what's going on. Um, you, you can email our email address is get in touch at ukssn.org.uk uh, to find out more and also um, email that address if you want to either join an existing regional network or UKSSN. Um, so we've got student groups, um, obviously the, the four students here today are from different regions. Um, we've got groups of teaching staff from all different subjects and areas of school and different regions and we've also got an operations staff group um, so they're, they're all there to join um, we're also in the process of setting up some new networks so if you're not if you don't see on the website your region covered we might be in the process of setting them up um, or it might be perhaps um, if there's a member of staff out there um, could help get a new network set up. 
Um, just to say, if you are a so safeguarding is super important because these are all school based and obviously we're working with young people. So if you're a school pupil um, watching, um, then make sure you email with your school email address, speak to your teacher. Um, you could ask them to email in or you can uh, copy them in when you when you email and then on social media. Uh, we're on Twitter and we're on Instagram. Uh, we were today talking in our meeting about potentially thinking about TikTok. Um, so you can, uh, um, we're at UK Schools Susty. And also many of the regional networks have their own accounts to, to, to follow as well. That's fantastic. Thank you so, so much. And I had all your links um, for the slides as well, so everybody could see it as you were speaking as well. And you're right, they are in the chat um, below. So I'm just going to finish with um, all of our young people back on back on screen again. All, thank you so, so much, everybody, for taking the time in the evening to, um, after a long day, and some of you are joining after the UK SSN meeting as well. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic to hear a bit about your journeys, what you're up to, and I think that you're all so inspiring. So I wish you all the best of luck um you're welcome the curious dog for any time if we do we could do like an annual kind of catch up with UKSN that'd be great to hear what you're up to and um yeah just kind of good luck with all the work that you're doing I hope it grows and grows so does everybody want to give a, a wave goodbye to um everybody online just give that thank you so much for having us on that's fine thank you uh, brilliant thank I'm just going to say goodbye to the um to everybody just watching so um everybody's back on now brilliant so for me thank you so much for joining back online again um there was everybody everybody can you give a wave again because <laughs> i lost some of you earlier <laughs> that's fantastic brilliant um